Lynn, but welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brandon Garrett. I teach here at Duke Law, but I know many of you are from outside our Duke University community, including our, our amazing guest today. And I'm, I'm really honored and excited to have commenting on my new book, which just came out two days ago. The book is called Autopsy of a Crime Lab. It's about forensic science. And I, I can't imagine three more exciting friends to have comment in the book, comment on their own work, and talk about how to solve these problems facing forensics evidence in our country and in the world. Uh, and the plan is that they're going to each reflect and talk, and I'll respond a little bit, but we really hope that you, you post questions in the chat because we'd like to have a, a panel conversation about these issues, which are we think are exciting ones for those of you who are, you know, lawyers, law professors, and care about scientific evidence. We hope this will be of interest. If you just like watching CSI shows and want to hear about how it's all fake, um, we can we can make sure we uh, correct your your misperceptions. And so, first we'll have uh, Professor Ed Cheng sharing his thoughts with us. He's the Hess Chair in Law at Vanderbilt University, not too far away from me. Uh, and his research focuses right on this topic on scientific and expert evidence, the interaction between law and statistics. He's the co-author of Modern Scientific Evidence, which is a big, big, big treatise and, and remarkable resource for, for lawyers. And he's also the host of Excited Utterance, a podcast, which I hope that you all tune into, uh, not least because he uh, taped an episode about my new book, but it's a wonderful weekly podcast focusing on evidence. Um, we have Aaron Murphy with, Aaron Murphy with us. Uh, and Erin comes to us from NYU Law School, and her research also focuses on forensic evidence, but also on technology issues and forensic DNA typing. And speaking of books, Erin uh, wrote a wonderful book back in 2015 called Inside the Cell, The Dark Side of Forensics DNA. So yes, even DNA evidence can go wrong. And Erin is also a co-editor of Modern Scientific Evidence. Uh, she's also working on a highly laborious project to revise a certain article 213 of the model penal code. Uh, finally, we also have uh, Dean Jennifer Manukin, Ralph and Shirley Shapiro Professor of Law and Dean at UCLA School of Law since 2015. And um, Jennifer Manukin has been working on two scientific evidence treatises, the modern scientific evidence treatise that our other speakers are part of, but also the new Wegmore. Uh, Dean Manukin is part of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, is on the board of the Law School Admissions Council. Uh, her work has been cited in, I think, every leading document on what to do about forensic science in this country, including the 2009 National Academy of Sciences report, which is a critical document in this area that we'll, you'll probably be hearing a little bit more about. So. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for watching the recording if you're not watching it live. We'd love to hear from you first, Ed. I'll meet myself and I'm, I'm really grateful again to all of you for, for thinking about my book and for sharing your own ideas. Well, thanks, Brandon. And uh, thanks to you and the Wilson Center for the invitation to be part of this round table. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk about your timely and important book. And it's just a great chance to reconnect with some old friends after a rather difficult year. So there's much that I agree with in the book. Many of the key reforms that Brandon outlines are part of my own wish list for the future of forensics. And many of them would bring forensics in line with modern scientific practice, which is long overdue. So for example, I too would like to see traditional match probabilities replaced, uh, or traditional match determinations replaced by probabilities and error rates. I'd like to see the, the further use of blind testing where analysts don't know what the desired result is. And in fact, whether or not the sample is even real or a test sample. And I'd also like to see a lot of the quality controls and standards that we've come to expect of our medical laboratories replicated in crime laboratories. What I want to focus on today, though, is not on that wish list, because I think that most commentators and probably all of us on the panel would probably agree that's effectively where we want to go. What I'd like to talk about is how we might get to that ideal world. And in other words, how we get from today, where there's a kind of 
painfully slow and grudging acknowledgement of the problems of forensic science to somewhere better. And on that score, one of the questions that evidence scholars have asked a lot in recent years is why Daubert never quite fulfilled its promise in this area. So why in the face of all the criticism of forensics have courts basically continued to admit it without a whole lot of uh, fanfare? Judge Rakoff, as discussed in the book, suggests that it might be a pro-prosecution bias. Uh, the book also further suggests that courts feel might feel constrained by precedent. And perhaps some of this is true, um, but I'm not so sure that I agree that as a general matter, this is just a blind imitation of the past. Um, I rather suspect that judges here are often being practical rather than just being narrow-minded. So as evidence academics, I think we tend to naturally think about admissibility. But increasingly, I think that this focus on admissibility is a mistake, at least when it comes to forensics. Judges are going to be reluctant to flat out exclude forensic evidence. And in some ways, I think for good reason that forensic evidence is potentially highly relevant. We know from even a microscopic hair comparison, which is the most one of the most maligned forensic methods out there, that these hair comparisons can exclude people. So if you find a straight black hair, well, it could have come from my head. If you find a blonde one, then it didn't. And obviously hair examiners have gone way over the line in overselling their identifications. But in the end of the at the end of the day, if you find a straight black hair, then that rules me in. Now, it doesn't prove that I did it, but it makes it somewhat more likely. And we may not even know exactly by how much, but the hair comparison has some evidentiary value. And I suspect that courts are just not going to exclude evidence with evidentiary value lightly, even if we don't have all of the things that we would like. So the population statistics, the error rates, and the blinding. The second thing is that even if you exclude the forensic evidence, then what? I mean, it's not like the prosecution is going to close up shop. What's going to happen is that the trial is simply going to proceed without the forensic evidence, and what's left is going to be this hodgepodge of eyewitness testimony and other evidence, which might arguably be worse in terms of reliability depending on the case. So that's why I think trying to get judges to exclude the evidence is gonna be a significant uphill battle. And I think probably that that's why Daubert has been one gigantic disappointment in this area. Globally speaking, yes, if you imposed exclusion, you might make the forensic labs produce better evidence, but judges tend to make rulings based on a specific case. And I think in a specific case, they're just not going to be inclined to throw out potentially useful information. What they will do is in many ways what they have done, which is to rein in expert testimony and try to prevent some of the egregious overselling. So on this issue of admissibility, of admissibility, I think I disagree a bit with the book. Um, I don't think that exclusion is all the most fruitful approach. But then I should also make clear that Brandon's book, very much to his credit, doesn't fall into the trap of focusing solely or even primarily on admissibility. And what's great about the book is that it takes a much broader systematic or systemic view of the forensics problem. And there, I think it really shines. So how does the book take this systemic view? Well, I think it does so in three ways. One is that there's this thread throughout the book about institutional practices and reforms that are outside of courts. So for example, Brandon talks about how TSA security screeners are subject to random proficiency proficiency testing through the introduction of test objects. So every once in a while you put in a gun or you put in a bag of drugs uh, and you have it screened and you see whether or not the screeners figure it out. And that makes me wanna know, so how did TSA get that implemented? I'll bet that security screeners originally opposed that kind of testing because it would expose them and it sort of stresses them out. 
uh, much like forensic examiners oppose this kind of testing today. But somehow, TSA made that standard practice. Another example is Brandon recounts how medical testing laboratories, both in the 60s and then in the 80s, were subject to greater federal regulation when it was discovered that their results were not reliable or that they weren't testing uh, their analysts. And I also want to know how that effort was successful and whether or not we might be able to learn from those experiences. To my mind, it seems that if we can understand how we pull those regulatory and cultural levers, it might be an effective way to get some of these reforms that we want in forensics. The second important thread in the book has to do with getting juries to understand the probative value and perhaps more importantly, the limitations of various forensic techniques. So rather than just waiting around for judges to save us from the bad science, much of Brandon's empirical research has asked how we can help juries help themselves. And one really important finding that I had not known about until I uh, read it in the book, and probably I should have, was that the language used by experts really doesn't matter very much, and that actually telling jurors the actual error rates or the statistical findings does. So they are actually able to help themselves if we give them the information. And then finally, Brandon says in his conclusion that, quote, judges must rethink their role as gatekeepers. Now, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave Brandon to this, but the phrase is a little vague. So he might just mean that judges should apply Daubert. But I interpret this as suggesting that judges should rethink, as in reconsider, their role as gatekeeper and instead think about perhaps being a facilitator. So as you've sort of seen from, from my talk so far, my view is improved forensics are, are not necessarily gonna come from gatekeeping, but I think it may come from empowering defense attorneys to get the information that they need to expose the weaknesses in the techniques. So things that the book talks about include judges demanding that expert reports contain more than just bold conclusions. And this is in line with standard evidence doctrine under Rule 705. Judges should impose full discovery in criminal cases so that attorneys can get the information that they need. And they should require defense access to forensic databases, as well as lab procedures and machines so that the defense can effectively do its own testing. And you see some of that in the case of breathalyzer tests uh, and in other places as well. And I think with this kind of access, then we might be able to rely on the adversarial process to do some of the work. So if prosecutors in forensic labs get beat up a couple of times, once the defense gets a hold of this information, then they're gonna to start to up their game. And then the defense attorneys are gonna retool and so on and so forth until we get closer to what we want. Um, but none of this can occur if courts allow the forensic labs to basically black, uh, black box themselves. So in sum, Autopsy of a Crime Lab is a delightful read. Those of you who haven't read it so far, uh, it's, a, it's a very easy read and it's, it's sort of fascinating in many ways. It also provides a lot of food for thought. And most importantly, I think it plots some promising new ways uh, away from admissibility uh, and away from Daubert that are um, better ways of pursuing forensic reform. So thanks a lot, Brandon. Thank you so much, Ed. So next, Jennifer. Sure. Um, first of all, thanks so much to uh, Brandon and to Duke and to the Wilson Center for the invitation to be here. Um, it's just a delight to get to spend a little while talking about Brandon's terrific new book and also getting to, to see uh, Aaron and Ed and, um, and to get to talk, talk turkey about evidence and forensic science. Um, so, so it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I want to focus on, on, like Ed, I want to focus on a couple of things I really loved about the book and then also ask a couple of questions. Um, I think one of the tremendous strengths of the book is just its, its synthetic quality. It really, uh, 
it reviews the entire range of issues around uh, crime labs and some of the challenges around them um, from quality assurance limitations to the problems with an insufficient focus on cognitive bias to uh, the fact that there isn't uh, proficiency testing or uh, an adequate focus on, on error detection uh, to the challenges of admissibility, um, the lack of discovery, um, the, the, the crime scene uh, efforts and some of the problems there. And so it really gives us sort of the whole soup to nuts uh, uh, range of engagements. And in so doing, it's not just synthetic, but it tells a really powerful story of how this is a, a, a pretty systematic set of problems, right? I mean, it's not just an issue in one area, but rather kind of from beginning to end, forensic science doesn't appear to be operating um, with a, a serious focus about making sure that we're doing all that is reasonably possible um, to ensure both accuracy and validity and to ensure transparency about what we know and what we don't know, right? So there's both questions about validity and accuracy, but also whether we're even just being candid systemically about, about these issues and these problems. Um, and so I think its scope is, is terrific. It's extremely readable. Um, it's got um, nice, anecdotes while being substantially more than a series of stories. Um, and while there's some anger in it, it's not breathless anger. It's not, um, it, it's not um, overdone uh, uh, vitriol. It's frustration at the seriousness of what's at stake here and the limits uh, to what we're doing right, given that there's so many realistic plausible ways that we could do this better. Like Ed, I take really no quarrel with the set of uh, policy suggestions at the end. I think they're all um, not only valuable and important, but, but quite feasible, um, which makes it even more frustrating that they, that they haven't happened. Um, I guess what I'll focus on here are a couple of places where Brandon's book got me thinking in ways that were novel and interesting, and then in some places where I wish he might have gone a little bit further in the directions that he does um, begin to explore. Um, one of them is around Houston and the Houston Crime Lab. Houston, in some ways, if there's a hero in the story, the Houston Crime Lab is the sort of uh, heroic alternative. Um, with, uh, with Stout, the head of that crime lab, being um, willing to, to operate in an extremely different way than most other crime labs. This came out of a series of very significant scandals, and Brandon tells that story well. Um, and he also describes how the Houston Crime Lab is working to be substantially both more transparent, putting lots and lots of materials on the web that most labs keep pretty secret, they're also doing blind testing. They're inserting actual blinds into the flow of research. This is something that in the forensic science uh, world, many were saying was either impossible or just vastly too difficult or expensive to do in a variety of these areas. And Houston has found a way and has worked to make it part of their, um, their, their, their standard procedures. Um, and so there's really a an alternative story here of a crime lab that's taken a variety of, the, of these steps from you know, sequential unmasking to blinding um, and, and the like. And so I was a little bit disappointed that the book didn't explore more whether this was making a difference really and how it was working and how it was being received by others. Right? So I want to both commend Brandon for the focus on this and for, for showing us a pathway but I, I wish he'd gone a little bit further and deeper there to help us understand, all right, is this actually, what's, what's, what's different here? There's still, as far as I know, using all of the same forensic techniques that other labs are using. If they're inserting blinds, what kind of results are they getting? Are there errors? How often? Um, what are we finding there? How are the forensic scientists' sense of their own role changing? Do they uh, do defense work? Do they take on um, 
uh, I, I assume that they they do, but like let's explore that a little bit more. And so I guess I, I would have I'd love to hear Brandon talk a little bit more about the the Houston experiment, so to speak, how well it's working, what lessons we can draw from it. Because if it's working very well, then there's a very powerful story to say this is feasible, folks. This is entirely doable, and here's why it matters. If it's not actually leading to very many changes on the ground, what does that mean, right? Does that mean that actually they're inserting blinds into firearm identification and the, and the investigators are getting them all right? Um, if so, what do we do with that? So, so I, 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 I would, I, I'd love to see Brandon explore that um, and tell us a little bit more about what we can learn from that experiment, its power, um, and its limits. Uh, two more places along similar lines that I both found the book to be um, really thought provoking, um, but also found myself um, uh, eager to hear a little bit more about what he would say. Um, one, and, and I agree with Ed that um, admissibility shouldn't be the primary focus. And I think to Brandon's credit, it really isn't the primary focus in the book. But there is a sort of puzzle here, which is why in this forensic science space, why the authority of traditional scientific elites has been so resolutely ignored by other elite parts of the system, right? We're in a moment right now where there's a lot of distrust of expertise, where there's a lot of um, anxiety about, about truth and whether we have any shared understandings. Um, and so we're in a moment where one might understand distrust of certain kinds of elite frameworks. But in the forensic science um, space, this goes a ways back, right? So the National Academy of Sciences report in 2009 was a blockbuster, as Brandon suggests, and really did um, shock many. It also wasn't what people were initially expecting from the group, right? The, when, when, the, when the report um, was first, first went forward, I think even the co-chairs really expected that they were going to find that there were some issues, there was a lot of underfunding, um, but they did not expect to find this substantial challenge around validity and the lack of scientific um, research undergirding techniques that have been used in the courts for a very, very long time. It surprised them, it surprised a great many observers. It didn't surprise a handful of academics who had been working on these issues for some years, but had been kind of toiling in the wilderness. Um, you know, I was one among them. Um, we, were, we were being ignored. And so it was sort of gratifying to see the National Academy of Sciences find that these were serious, serious concerns. As Brandon details, the courts didn't do much with this, with, with this report. Sometimes they ignored it altogether. Often they gestured to it. They said, oh, look, yes, this report, it suggests there's issues, but nonetheless, this evidence is good enough to let the jury hear it and decide what to do with it, right? So there was a, 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 a move of a great many judges to kind of vaguely gesture, but not really take the import of the report seriously. The same largely has happened with the report that came out years later from the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. One of the people who spearheaded that second report was Eric Lander, who now has been uh, nominated to be uh, President Biden's um, you know, cabinet level science advisor. And, uh, and uh, Eric Lander really was, I think, quite offended by the degree to which scientific evidence that was being regularly regularly used in court simply wasn't um, adequately scientific. Um, he has a history of involvement with these issues that goes back to early DNA cases where he played an influential role. Um, but he was really one of the, 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 the those who spearheaded um, the PCAST report. The PCAST report again found in essence that not very much had changed and Brandon details that at, at, I think very well and describes uh, the report and its findings. The report found that a few kinds of forensic science had had just enough testing to meet foundational validity. Uh, that report found, for example, that there was just enough research on fingerprint evidence. I think that's actually at that moment, especially, was a contestable claim. Um, but in any event, they put fingerprint on the side of having just enough uh, actual research to support foundational validity, while suggesting that many other kinds of forensic science that are regularly used did not yet have that. 
and therefore really shouldn't be used until they did. Again, courts have largely deflected, sometimes ignoring, sometimes gesturing, but explaining away. And other um, institutional locations where we might have expected people to have to take these reports seriously largely haven't. Um, you know, the Department of Justice uh, didn't much take the report on board, even in the Obama administration, much less um, in the Trump administration that followed it. Um, some of what other groups said about the report um, are frankly, we're, we're just hard to, to, to sort of take with a straight face. Um, Brandon details um, one episode afterwards where a set of people, including um, folks within the DOJ, said that the report had failed to consider a great many studies that if only they'd looked at them would have gotten them to different results, right? And so they said, you know, there's just this report just didn't even look at the right things. And so uh, the members of PCAST, and I, I should note that I played a role in uh, chairing a, a group of lawyers uh, and judges and a couple of deans who were advisory to the PCAST report. So I want to sort of just, just note that I'm perhaps not a completely unbiased uh, narrator of this. Um, but nonetheless, PCAST said, really? We've missed things? We're terribly sorry. Please share them. Tell us what they are. What did we not look at that we should have? We'd be delighted to take a look. And, um, you know, sort of a bit shamefacedly, those who had made this claim had to come back and say, actually, upon second, uh, a, a closer second look, there really weren't any studies that we can point to that arguably meet the criteria that you put forward um, and that you've ignored. Um, and so I guess what, what's, what's, what's interesting about this, Brandon compares at a couple of different times in his book, he compares the, the reception of of the recognition of these issues in forensic science to other spaces, right? Like hospitals, like quality assurance in the medical field, um, like some other National Academy reports that have gotten more attention. And so I think there's a kind of um, interesting puzzle about why in this space, the um, findings of relatively neutral groups of elite scientists have been so deeply ignored. And I don't think we can just say, well, it's because a lot of judges were former prosecutors or because some of these things have been used for a long time. I don't know that I have a complete answer. I mean, I might have some, some ideas about it and I'd be happy to talk about it, but I'd really be interested in hearing what Brandon would say about how to explain why in this space, there's been a particular ability to ignore these findings, even as the more general concerns about wrongful conviction, which Brandon has played such a leading role in bringing to light and exposing have become more commonly understood. Right, so so the the challenges with with law enforcement more generally, the challenges with our our, our system of justice, and the fact that we make mistakes, um, are, that, that is so much better understood now, including by the public who who watches shows on 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 Netflix and listens to podcasts and reads New Yorker stories, and so there's a much more deeply understood recognition of some of those limits. And yet in this crime lab forensic science space, there's been really remarkably, um, I, I don't want to say no change because there has been some, but remarkably little change, all things considered. And so I'm sort of curious to hear uh, what, what Brandon would, would, would say about that. Final question, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude here. Um, and this one gets maybe a little bit more technical or in the weeds. Um, Brandon talks in a number of ways about wanting to open up the black box of, of forensic science and of what's going on in crime labs. And I'd like to press him a little bit on what he means by this, because he's a little bit ambiguous in the book along two different dimensions, right? One of them is about whether there's adequate testing of forensic scientists' um, ability to reach conclusions accurately. And um, he argues quite clearly that we need better proficiency tests. He talks about how easy some of the proficiency tests that we have are and how it's just a, a very serious problem if we're not giving juries and the public 
better information about how frequently mistakes are made. And I completely agree with him on that score. And that would be sort of one way of thinking about what opening up the black box means. On the other hand, sometimes that kind of engagement is still referred to as black box testing, right? Where you're not um, actually, you don't really care how they're doing it. You just care if they're doing it well. And in forensic science, there's been a rather limited um, uh, interest in some of these fields about either one, either looking at how well they do it or looking at whether we can understand what it is that they are actually doing. And here I thought the book wasn't entirely clear, right? So if we do imagine a world where we insert lines into the normal, uh, the normal forensic science workflow and we do it um, in a sophisticated enough way that they don't know what the blinds are or whether they're being tested or not. If we do other studies, both, um, both, both testing that we know to be tests and inserted into the normal workflow that tests examiners, and we find out that they're pretty darn good at what they're doing, that they make mistakes, but not that often, um, that we, we develop some kinds of um, both false positive and false negative rates for examiners with who've gone through adequate training and have, have a good deal of experience. But if we still have pretty subjective underlying methods, if these examiners are still really eyeballing things and um, reaching decisions based on their um, best judgment and experience, is that enough for you, Brandon? Or would you still have a set of concerns because of the um, subjectivity of the underlying methodologies um, that, they're, that they're using and operating on. Um, and so I'd love to invite you to give us, to tell us a little bit more about that as well. Overall, I think this book is much needed. I hope it gets very broad readership. I think it's, uh, it's, it's thoughtful, synthetic, not overstated, a little bit angry, but not breathless. And, offers the opportunity um, to bring back greater attention to um, trying to create um, a, a, um, a broader national engagement with how to make improvements here that certainly uh, we haven't been able to um, do um, since the NAS report and even before. So congratulations. Thank you so much. And I hope I have time to, to talk about some of the questions and topics that you raised because they're really, really interesting ones. Um, and, uh, but first I wanna turn things over to Aaron. Uh, so I will try to try to be, keep this um, tight so that we can, in fact, get to the discussion. I want to just start out by saying, of course, it's such a pleasure to be here to talk about Brandon's book. I swear it's not just because we've been in social isolation for the last year. Um, in fact, when I got the actual physical book, it has these discarded gloves on the cover. And I feel like that's that means something different now. This is the new thing you see on the ground in New York, you know. Uh, but um, it is a joy and an honor to be here, uh, especially in this incredible group, a group that I usually get to see maybe once a year or so professionally and catch up with personally and learn from. And so in some ways, um, you know, it's just delightful to be in your company. And I have to say, I scrolled the participants and there's some of the leaders in this space, in practice, in academia and other institutions uh, globally. And so it's really delightful. Uh, to have a chance to have this conversation. Um, I'm also, of course, mainly delighted because I get to celebrate Brandon and this incredible book and uh, the accomplishment of his fourth book in the midst of a global pandemic with a partner who's busier than he is, I think it's fair to say, and he's a pretty busy guy. Um, so it's just an incredible achievement. And um, he tells, as usual, this story better than I think anyone else could, especially um, as Jennifer said, without the sort of breathless anger, which I kind of associate more with my brand. Um, so the, um, <clears throat> the, the sort of structure of my comments, I wanna heap some compliments on the book in hopes that it, it draws in some of the members here to get their hands on it, because I think it's important to read. And then I would like to raise a few questions. Uh, so first, the compliments or what I like about this book. Uh, it turns out they all ended up being C words, which I don't know what the theme is there. But the first is I really love its conversational tone. And this is something that's always true about Brandon. He's such a clear and a straightforward writer. He takes these really complex topics that are very interdisciplinary in nature. 
And, you know, he makes them really come alive and really become um, something that you're invested in as a real problem of humanity and not just an abstract legal debate or scientific or doctrinal debate. He really invests his readers with a sort of stake in the story and curiosity about the sort of way forward. So for instance, you know, he likens the struggles over including error rates or not to a child demanding a perfect score on a test because he refused to answer any of the questions and therefore didn't technically get any wrong, something I'm not gonna tell my kids about. Uh, you know, he uses the legendary 76 judgment of Paris to make a point about con cognitive bias. Possibly my personal favorite, he describes Sandy Levick's work at PDS in the special litigation division as the X-Files of a public defender's office. I'm like, I should have worked in the X-Files division. Um, and he even sets up the, the release of this 2009 report that we keep referring to this landmark study from the NAS uh, that called into question all these disciplines um, by like describing the gossipy scene at a double AF, AFS meeting, you know, as like, what does it say? Have you seen it yet? As though it were like the end of the undoing or like the Mueller report or something like that. Um, so it's such a joy to read just because it takes these dry, sometimes even technical issues and makes them come alive. The second thing I really loved about it is how comprehensive it is. And many of us who work in forensics tend to specialize, especially because it often requires a scientific or statistical expertise that for lawyers can be hard to come by. So we end up focusing on a single discipline or maybe even an era, you know, I'm the AI person or I'm the DNA person or I'm the 1.0 tech person. And I think Brandon's expertise across time and subject is really critical here because it allows him to use what we've learned in the past to shed light on the future. And so, you know, while I think many people know his work uh, in the kind of 1.0 methods of pattern matching, like bite hair tool mark, fire investigations, uncovering the sources of wrongful convictions um, through those kind of 1.0 methods. He's also in this book really doing, as I think Jennifer said, a soup to nuts, which was actually the exact phrase I kept thinking, soup to nuts, soup to nuts. I don't even know what it means, but um, of forensics, you know, he's talking about the 1.0 methods. He's bringing in the kind of transition methods like DNA, but he's also looking forward to AI or facial recognition or big data, these other uh, techniques. And I think that's especially important in this moment of time because, as he notes in the book and is so important, databases have transformed forensics. Those are his exact words. And we no longer think about spent shell casings or latent prints as a 1.0 technology when they're also tapping into these big data interfaces or they're using AI technologies or they're interfacing with other programs like facial recognition, et cetera. And so the ability to trace the problems of the past through the revised uh, sort of implementation today and what it might mean for the future, I think is a critical, critical piece of the literature that we need to focus on and that this book does so well. And then lastly, uh, this book is so compelling. It's just a compelling read and it's compelling in two ways, I think. One is that um, it compellingly uses the voices of those wrongly accused and incarcerated as a sort of center that holds the narrative. So when he talks about Keith Harward or Joseph Buffy or George Rodriguez or Juan McFall, when he puts their words on the page, it really makes the urgencies uh, feel acute. It makes the problem and the injustices in this field feel very stark and very real and not as abstract. And even some of the legal figures like Judge Rakoff or Peter Stout or Peter and Barry, uh, who founded the Innocence Project, you know, they come through as real people, you know, humans, not just sort of legendary figures or ideas, trying to face this broken system and come up with solutions. And so it makes it something that I think, um, again, becomes less of a sort of abstract indictment of a system and more of the real challenges of how it affects these human beings and how to fix it with human, human tools. It's also not just narratively compelling, it makes a compelling case because after cataloging the dire state of forensics from sort of soup to nuts, he lays out his blueprint for fixing forensics, which you know, in some ways is the kind of eight point plan that he summarizes at one point in the book, but um, and that others have addressed uh, in some of their comments about how to go forward. So let me move from my heaps of praise to some of the questions or comments I had so that we can make sure we have enough time for conversation with the group. Um, the first is I've, so I've sort of go increasingly from like minor questions to kind of bigger picture. The first is that I actually couldn't tell exactly where you came out on a national commission. So you talk about the commission, you criticize it's shuddering at some level, you worry about NIST as a kind of alternative. 
You note a lot the state commission model and the failure of that model to propagate or the sort of unique success of Texas's commission. You talk about CSAFE's work, obviously, but I wasn't quite clear whether if you had Biden's ear right now or maybe Eric Lander's ear right now, one thing would be a national commission in its sort of former form or some new form or whether in fact state commissions is a better model to think through a reform, like sort of trying to duplicate Texas. Second, I really loved um, how you talked about mass forensic error. I'm not sure if this is a familiar term. I, I hadn't really thought of it in those terms quite the same, but I, I liked the framework of thinking of um, some of these situations, whether discipline specific, like the hair example uh, that you use throughout the book, or analyst specific, like the Massachusetts lab, or you know, even a couple analysts say, um, or a single lab, you know, how to think about these mass failures and what it would mean to unwind them back, not just to prevent them going forward. And so um, you talked about laws where they um, allow reopening of cases because of changed evidence. So for disciplines, maybe that's one solution. But I think thinking about forensic error, not just in preventing it prospectively, but understanding how to correct it retrospectively is going to be an increasingly important part of what we're doing these days. The third is um, something that a lot of others have touched on, so I, I won't spend too much time, but you know, it is important that your book touches on more than legal interventions and judicial interventions, because as you note, you, know, you give an entire chapter to the failure of, of judges to, to do their job. And there's um, you know, obviously so much in your book that strikes one as how long this story has been going on. You know, I think you give an example from 1984, the FBI hair manuals, where they said like, don't do this. And then of course everyone does it. And so there's a question I think about how much we have just, we should just give up on courts, frankly, and how much we should say, you know what, courts haven't worked, you know, whether those are legal actors or judicial actors, and we need to focus on other actors, whether going straight to labs or straight to the legislative branch, um, sort of whether to, again, just to use the words, give up on courts. And I noticed one of the questioners before I began speaking had raised the interdisciplinary nature of forensics. And I think one thing about the interdisciplinary nature is it does give you these points of intervention that maybe other legal aspects, um, other legal questions don't quite do. And then the last two things uh, I'd point out are first, the tension between the exculpatory and inculpatory stories in forensics. And this is something as a DNA person, I feel very acutely and I have my own answers. Um, but I think, you know, Ed's comments also point, point to this at some level, which is the sort of rule me in, rule me out quality of forensics because you know, you have uh, Exoneree Tribble saying, I thank God for DNA in a book that also criticizes, you know, the use of some of these techniques in some ways. You talk a lot about the false negative aspect of the Mayfield story, the fingerprint story, or the need to improve crime scene processing, or the need for jurors to hear not just about, um, you know, possibility of in inclusion, error inclusion, type one and type two errors, basically, you know, inclusion errors, but also exclusion errors for other for finding value of evidence to be inconclusive. And I think it's hard to have a clear and consistent and com comprehensible message about forensics when it can seem at least to a lay person that you're saying it's junk unless it exonerates. And so struggling with the tension there between this inculpatory and exculpatory use. And then lastly, um, I kept thinking as I read your book, you know, is this a watershed moment in forensics or not? Is this a turning point? Is this a landmark moment? Is this, you know, is this something that we're gonna look back on as a moment where forensics really changed? And I think there's a lot of arguments in flavor, in favor. There's been a string of blows, right? There's been the 2009 report, the PCAST report, the output of the National Commission. We have, um, a, you know, a massive social uprising for the first time in decades over policing and social justice issues. Policing is recognized as a more political enterprise than it has been for many years. Um, we see legislative efforts to restrict things like facial recognition or AI. We see greater judicial awareness, Carpenter, Jones, cases where they're starting to reckon with technology and how it interfaces with policing. We see a progressive prosecutor movement. Somebody mentioned Eric Lander, Jennifer mentioned Eric Lander having a cabinet appointment. There's a lot of reasons to think we're in a watershed moment. Uh, but then I sort of get clawed back by the fact that we got the resistance to PCAS from even Obama justice appointees and Trump and Sessions obviously kneecapped reform entirely, or the fact that the Breathe Act, the signature platform of the Black Lives Matter movement, 
doesn't really say much about forensics. It says post-conviction DNA access, but it doesn't talk about the stockpiling of 17 million people's DNA in a database. It doesn't, it actually supports more funding for forensics, which I think, you know, can be read ambiguously. We have, as Jennifer notes, the distrust of science and expertise. We have examples of forensics being used in this unchecked, quite frightening way, as you detail throughout the book, uh, in terms of, you know, everyone's faces being stored, et cetera. So there feels like, a, it also feels like a familiar moment, these moments where we've been here before in 2009 or what have you, and we thought it'll all change now because the, the curtain's been lifted and yet nothing feels like it changes. So kind of thinking about this moment and its uniqueness or non-uniqueness. But in short, just echoing what everyone else has said, it's an incredible read. It's an essential read for anyone who's practicing in the field of criminal justice in any way. Uh, and I, I thank you for giving us so much to think about as well as bringing us together to do that. Thank you. These are really, really great comments. And I kind of want to say just a few things about them and, and then turn to some of the great questions we've been getting on the chat. But thank you all. And thank you, Melissa, and the folks at the Wilson Center for putting this event on. Um, you know, I, I do have some real optimism about forensics, and maybe I shouldn't. And certainly in the book, I talk about how some new technologies are actually creating more problems and more dangers for error. Um, I, I do believe in, you know, the things I say in the book and the things I do in the book, trying to humanize people. I think that people who work on forensics are really interesting, hardworking people who have challenging jobs. And I do think that there is, has been a real culture change. There's a, a real interesting paper that I'm working on right now where uh, Nick Skurich and I surveyed um, firearms and tool mark examiners around the country. And you see this cultural divide where uh, there's a, a, a group of up and coming examiners who welcome statistical approaches, who welcome expressing their conclusions and probabilities and not just saying it's a source ID or a match like they used to in the past and who think that you know black box studies of the type that Jennifer mentioned are a good thing and there should be more of them and you see like another sort of half of the group that says that this is all ridiculous we've been doing this for decades these people don't understand what we do there are a bunch of like PhDs who don't understand what real firearms work is this is all garbage leave us alone and and just and and but that's within the community, and I think it's it is kind of exciting actually that there there's a real diversity of approaches in some of these communities now, and you see you know you're starting to see more labs and more people in these communities talk about the need for for real research to establish the foundations of their disciplines and and a willingness to talk about it in their reports and in court, and that's exciting. Uh, and that said, you know there's a Firearms, on the topic of firearms, there's a case my students are working on an amicus brief where you have a kind of a sophisticated -y type examiner from a large lab who says, oh, I've read the PCAST report, but that was written by these supposed scientists who really weren't qualified. Like none of them were firearms examiners. They don't understand what we do. Um, they talked about some study about error rates, which is totally made up. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't really matter that much because let me tell you about me. My zero error rate is my own, and I've never made a mistake. I have a personal error rate of zero. Uh, I, I get proficiency tested, these like super easy joke tests. I have never made a mistake in my work. So I, I'm sure it's possible for sloppy people to make errors, but I don't. And so listen to me. And this firearm is a source identification. It's a match. And so kind of the same old testimony, but wrapped around some of the more important scientific statements and trying to sort of smother them with uh, you know, personal confidence and self-satisfaction in one's work. So, you know, you read something like that and think, oh God, nothing's changed. Uh, I think that they, I, we could say more about the, the experience in the Houston lab. They, they, they're sharing data on their blinds with this group of researchers called CSAFE, the Center for Statistics and Applications of Forensic Evidence that I'm a part of. They're actually expanding that work to look at the testimony of their examiners in court and reviewing that. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's a culture that, yeah, some pe sometimes people make mistakes. Uh, to provide a quick answer to what Jennifer is at, uh, asking about, like, you know, is it okay to have a black box where you don't know exactly what the person is doing? They're using their experience, their training, they're not measuring anything in particular. They're just like think, using their experience to reach conclusions about evidence. My view is if they're accurate, like if the TSA person can't tell you what looks funny about some of the images and causes them to think that it's a bomb, 
but, but they always catch the bomb. Great. We don't care what they're doing as long as they're accurate. However, if they make mistakes, then you have to open the black box. Then you have to figure out like, well, what was ambiguous about that image that caused you to miss the bomb or to mismatch the firearms or the fingerprint? Then you need to do some, some root cause and figure out what's going on. And that's, and that's sort of the approach at a lab like the F HSFC. They're not just testing everyone in the lab uh, to see who makes more errors and report uncertainty. I mean, you need to do that. You need to report error rates, but it's also to figure out, well, why, why did this person make mistakes? Are they poorly trained or is it more likely that people make errors if the evidence is of low quality and maybe you just don't want to be doing examinations of low quality evidence or is there some other problem? Um, is the person looking at too many images in one day and they're getting burned out or whatever? Uh, and so, you know, I think that, but I, I agree, there are lots of different uses of black box and I talk about black box algorithms and lots of ways that we don't know what's going on the need to just have work be documented, to have discovery. That's an, another like something that judges can do without excluding evidence. I mean, the fact that it's okay in many places for lawyers to get like a one page report that often has like one line of relevant text, which just says, this was identified as that, no documentation, no markings. You don't know how long the person did the work, who worked on it, what they did, what they found, nothing. I mean, that's just, it's an embarrassment that that counts as adequate discovery in a criminal case. And anyway, I could go on. I'd love to, we don't have too much time. I'd, lo I'd love to take on some of these great questions that we've had. Um, one question was, it's kind of come up, like why doesn't the forensics community take on some of this stuff? Like it shouldn't be up to courts and shouldn't be up to lawyers like us to solve these problems. If you think crime labs would want to do something about it. I don't know if you saw the news, like the, the Boston uh, Globe just reported like a huge expansion of the inquiry into cases in Massachusetts, like multiple times the number of tens of, it was already tens of thousands of cases. It's, it's now metastasized into reopening potentially like many, many more tens of thousands of cases. So like, why aren't those labs doing top to bottom regulation and error detection now, now that they know how, how enormous these problems can become? Um, I'm kind of curious what, 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 what some of our guest thoughts are on this. Why isn't there more self-regulation? I would just jump in and say, uh, first, hi to Carol. Um, but the uh, I think it's also really important to recognize that the pressures on labs to process enormous volumes of cases lead to a lot of the type of shortcuts and incentives to cut corners, et cetera. And so, yes. you know, there is a, both a financial component to that. There's a how you get ahead by processing cases component to it. There's a self-interest and I want to go home component. There's a lot of components to it, but, you know, I, and that way, I think we have to link forensics directly to mass incarceration, right? We have to link the volume of cases coming through and how they're focused on, you know, could you spend more time carefully looking at your capital case if the lab wasn't spending so much time processing marijuana samples? Maybe so, you know, or cocaine samples. So I think there is a connection that hasn't yet been drawn that's important to look at between how forensics are used in the kind of huge volume amount of cases versus in the cases where I think most lay people care the most about the I jump in and add two quick points to, to Aaron's uh, thoughtful answers. Um, I, I think one of them is uh, something that you say in the book, Brandon, which is you know overworked, big, big, uh, you know, lot, not enough money, and not even necessarily the degrees or the background to do it themselves, right? So it's easy to um, uh, ignore when it doesn't seem like something that you can easily get hold of and solve. Um, when you've got, you know, 400 day backlogs and not enough money and besides which you have maybe an undergraduate science degree yourself. So how would you even go about um, studying it if you wanted to? Um, but the second, I do think this is a place where the courts matter. And so even though all three of us in some sense said that we didn't think admissibility should be the focus, fundamentally, the courts have required remarkably little of these fields, right? Maybe some slight language changes, like, okay, don't say that you're 100% certain and can never make a mistake. Just say that you're almost completely certain, then it would be shocking if you made a mistake, right? Like take the language down a little bit, but really don't, don't require much change. And since the, the, the court is the ultimate audience for these findings, I mean, to be sure, 95% cases plead, most things don't ever get to the court, but still the courtroom is kind of the, the outer boundary for these technologies and their purposes. If there's just no pressure to do something different from 
coming from the courts, combined with not really having the background knowledge or expertise to know how, um, and uh, a shortage of funds. You know, why try to do a really a, a very hard research projects that at best will show that you're almost as good at doing what you do as you've been saying you are. So if, if I can highlight Tess Neal's point that she just uh, put through, you know, about how this is cultural, this is why I think a lot of this is about institutional change, that if you, you have a place like Houston, and so that becomes the model, but the question is how you get from where you are to Houston. Um, one of the things that I thought was striking about your, um, your discussion about the medical laboratories is that that took place, you know, you, you said it was post-World War II that they started to realize that this was a problem. And you have two sets of big uh, legislation in the 60s and the 80s. So we're talking 40, 50 years before we get our act together on the medical laboratories. And a lot of that may have a lot to do with generational changes. So actually what's really interesting is your, your, your comment, Brandon, about how there's this new generation that is comfortable with the statistics and wants to do it this way and wants to do it in the empirical way. In some ways you have to wait for them to take over and for that, for that cultural change to occur. And, and the real question will be whether you can accelerate that or whether, you know, you don't really, we don't really have 50 years to wait for forensics to change here. But uh, I think that some of the psychology here, some of maybe the business literature on these kinds of questions of how you get an organization to pivot, um, that's going to be a, a lot of the, re, uh, a lot of the ways that we're going to get at this. I talk about the army crime lab and how they had, you know, a, a, a a plane crash on an aircraft carrier and they knew they had a problem, right? They knew that people on the aircraft carrier were using drugs and their drug testing program wasn't catching it. I mean, there's another piece of it, which I didn't get into in the book and federalism and federal legislation and the like, like clinical laboratories, like hospitals can't not comply with conditions of like Medicaid. And like, there's so much federal money that goes into the healthcare system that it's just easier to regulate nationally. Um, and, and by, by the way, there is some of um, some work that's sort of in press and coming out soon reporting on some of the Houston crime lab data. And some of it is really interesting. Some of it also speaks to how often does the print that does do these algorithms actually give you the print that is the true candidate print? Because that's part of the blind testing, right? They put the blind print, the one where they have a correct answer in the database. And sometimes the database doesn't turn it up. Like that part of the blind testing program is also really interesting too, because these labs have no idea how good these databases are. Um, but I can tell you quickly that what all these studies have been showing and fingerprinting and some of these other pattern disciplines and even more so is that most of the errors are false negatives, false inconclusives, which are really important. And the focus has very much mostly been on well, false positives. You know, do you pick an innocent person's print, but that the bigger error rates are missing uh, connections or deciding that evidence isn't good enough to work with when in fact you could have done something with it. Uh, but, but you know, there's a lot to be learned from these programs and, and hopefully that'll start get changing the culture. If people realize, oh, there's like, you know, um, this, this can help us do the work that we need to do in our lab or it can help us avoid spending $30 million like they've spent so far in Massachusetts and they're gonna spend a lot more, uh, you know, I mean, that. That, that crisis, we thought it was, it was like, the, it's already been the biggest audit in the country. It's about to get a lot, lot bigger. Um, so do we have, I think we're kind of out of time. We, we're getting some great questions. Uh, Heidi's uh, comment about mission and budget uh, is, is a really, really um, important one that Houston actually controls its budget too, because it's an independent crime lab. And, and there are a lot of ways, like, you know, if you, if you have labs where their budgets are tied to fees imposed on indigent people for their DNA testing fee and the like, where they often can't pay the fee. I mean, that's, that's a whole other piece of this that I wish I'd had more time to talk about in the book, that you have labs that are, that are in part supported by fees, which may be unconstitutional if you're imposing them on criminal defendants that don't have ability to pay. And that's the funding structure. And then you have F federal grants which are backlog grants. And so you kind of have an incentive to keep up a backlog so you can keep getting those grants. I mean, it's there's all sorts of horrible problems with the way that we fund the work. And when you talk to forensic examiners, I mean, they talk about it with the overwhelming pressure that they get from law enforcement to, to deliver results fast. And then if they get too far behind, then you have law enforcement uh, 
turning to these really unreliable field kits so that they can do forensic tests themselves. And that's like even worse, right? Where you have untrained people trying to run forensics through, through problematic tools. And so uh, anyway, um, I'm thinking we should probably actually log off. We only got to kind of get to all talk about one question, but I, I know our students need to return to their classwork and uh, people need to eat their lunches and get back to their lives. But I, I just, I'm so grateful to be able to share this time with you. It was really great to see you, Aaron and Ed and Jennifer. And I wish we could have gone all day. Clearly we're gonna have to have some kind of reunion when, this, when the paperback version comes out. Yes, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah, exactly. Zoom, and everybody Zoom book tour isn't really the thing, but maybe we can, I can come in person before too long. And everyone on the call should definitely get a hold of the book. It's very, very much worth reading. I will say Peter Stout and I are hoping to tell the HSFC story in a little bit more detail in a podcast that we have pitched with the Crime Lab Insider and then I guess I'm the outsider. So we would be, it's like an odd couple uh, podcast that we're working on. We'll, we'll see if it gets anywhere. So will, so will it be, uh, it will be a podcast on the Houston Crime Lab uh, or j just that particular episode? It would be sort of a short series on all the different ways that forensics can go wrong, but it'll involve sort nice. of characters in the lab and explaining how lab work works and the realities of it combined with problems and errors. We'll see. Great. Nice. Sounds great. So great to see you all. Thank you everyone for watching. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon.